Hi, everybody, and welcome to our first midweek Advent service. Whether you're worshiping here at Word of Life, Christ our Savior, New Song, or somewhere else, we want to thank you for joining us as we begin this expectation journey through the season of Advent. Over the next three weeks, we're going to look at certain people in the Old Testament, the expectation upon their birth, and then how it correlates to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to our lives as well. So I want to thank you for joining us. And over the course of the next number of minutes, we get a chance to hear some scripture readings. We get a chance to sing some songs of the season and hear a great message that is going to bring home the power of Jesus' birth in our lives. May God be with you in your time of worship. Oh, come at 
We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We stand in the covenantal steps of Abraham, the great fathers of the Old Testament, those gathered to Israel as a promised land, the kings who ruled over them, those taken in captivity, and those who returned after they had been freed looking for something more. We stand with those who looked forward to Jesus, those who saw him, those who received his mercies, and all who have worshipped him over the span of centuries and millennia. We stand with those yet unborn, but who are already numbered as saints of the promise given in ancient times. We stand with expectations, many of the same expectations from God that our ancestors have had. Will you love us, God? Will you care for us? Will you protect us? Will you prosper us? Will you show us favor? Will you forgive us and redeem us? It is these expectations that lead us to worship, worship through our service, our study, and our continued preparations. Let us confess these expectations and profess our faiths in this Advent creed, trusting that what we say about God is true. We confess together. We believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, the one who is full of patience, who is not afraid of silence, who does not need to fill each moment with activity and noise. Where the Father is patient, we confess that we are not. Fill us with patience, Heavenly Father. We believe in God the Son, Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, who slipped into Bethlehem one night, mostly unnoticed, who lived his earthly life without headlines or hurry, who frequently took time alone with his Father, who waited for the right time to become the suffering servant, who stood quietly before the noise of his accusers, whose silence overpowered their words, who died then rose again on a quiet Sunday morning. Where Jesus shows compassion, we confess that we have not. Fill us with compassion, Lord Jesus. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens, empowers, renews, and refreshes, sometimes arriving with obvious power, sometimes with the quiet breath of a whisper. Where the Holy Spirit renews and strengthens, we confess that we have not. Fill us with encouragement, Holy Spirit. We believe in one God who waits for us and who longs for us to do the same. Where God waits, we confess that we do not. Fill us with restraint, Almighty God. Turn now my waiting heart, glorious King. 
Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue to be childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, this, shall, this man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Genesis chapter 22 says, and the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice." Hebrews chapter 11 says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Triumph and breaks 
When beauty gilds the eastern hills And life to joy awakes Not as of old a little child To bear and fight and die But crowned with glory like the sun That lights the morning sky Oh, brighter than the rising morn When Christ victorious rose And left the lonesome place of death Despite the rage of foes Than that glorious morn shall dawn upon our race The day when Christ in splendor comes And we shall see his face The King shall come when morning dawns And light and beauty brings Hail Christ the Lord your peace Come quickly, King of Kings. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks as we turn our attention to your word, especially during this season of Advent. Heavenly Father, there are a lot of expectations in our lives, and as we look through the Old Testament and we think about the expectations on certain people's birth, we want to think about what it means when we think about the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, your Son. And so, Heavenly Father, whatever our expectations are and whatever expectations we see fulfilled in Scripture, may it be a great blessing to us, especially during this special season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you remember all of those celebrities who said that whatever president, whoever it is, whether it's a Republican or Democrat, if so-and-so gets elected, that they're going to move out of the country? You guys remember those? How many of those celebrities are actually still here, and how many have actually moved away? All of them are still here. Nobody's going to move away. They understand what America is all about. They understand that it's just an empty thread or might gain some type of newsworthy headline. Just this past weekend, Lincoln Riley, former head coach now of Oklahoma, was asked after their loss on Saturday night, are you going to be the next head coach of LSU? And he very definitively said, no, I am not going to be the next head coach of LSU. Well, less than 24 hours later, he was a new head coach, but of course it was not LSU, it was USC over in sunny Southern California. So it was true, he promised that he wasn't going to be the head coach of LSU, he just didn't say that he was still going to be the head coach of Oklahoma. And I think a lot of the people at Oklahoma, whether it's his players or whether it's a lot of the students or the faculty or administration, assumed that when he said he was not going to be the head coach of LSU, that that meant that he was staying put in Oklahoma. And little did they realize that he was going to be moving to a different college, different university, and being head coach for their football team instead. We have a lot of expectations when it comes to promises, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about as we kick off this new midweek Advent sermon series, is that promises bring expectations with them. With every promise, there is a certain amount of expectation. If I promise you something, you expect that I'm not only going to hold true to those promises or that promise, whatever it might be, but also there are probably other expectations that go along with that. Same, if I want to have a promise from somebody else, there are some expectations, things that I'm expecting. We all have some type of expectations when something or somebody promises us what we are looking for or what we want to hear. And it's nothing different, I believe, in Scripture and for some of the people in the Bible when they were promised something by God. The first 
person that we're going to look at in the Old Testament, and we're going to think about the expectations that go with their birth and kind of think about the birth and the expectations of our Lord Jesus Christ, is Isaac, way, way back in the Old Testament. Somewhere around 4,000 years ago, Isaac was born into this world, and his birth came with a lot of expectations. And so I'm going to read the text here, and then we'll talk about it for the next couple of minutes and some of the expectations that Abraham and Sarah, his parents, are going to have. So here is what the book of Genesis chapter 17 says. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation." But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. So there is the promise that God is giving to Abraham. And if we want to think about the context of this, years before God had come to Abraham and said, I am going to give you an heir and I am going to establish a covenant, not just with you, but with your lineage, with your family. And they are going to grow into a great nation. And it's going to be a powerful nation. It's going to be one that goes over all the earth and you will not be able to number your descendants. And this will be an everlasting covenant with you. I promise. And so over a number of years, Abraham was waiting with faith for God to fulfill that promise. And so years later, then God comes back to Abraham and says to him again, I am going to fulfill that promise. Now, Abraham, after years of not having this promise fulfilled through his wife, Sarai, he said, you know what? I'm going to have a child with somebody else. His wife gave him permission so that I might be able to fulfill this covenant. And so he has a son named Ishmael. And so he thought that Ishmael was going to be his heir because as the years went on, he was getting older and he wasn't going to have this child, Isaac, until he was 80 years old. And so when God comes to him after many, many years and says, you are now going to have a child at this age and your wife at this age is going to have a child, he laughed. He didn't believe it necessarily. He thinks it's still going to be through Ishmael. God says, no, this is going to be through your son, a direct son of yours through your wife, Sarah. And it's interesting. Her name was Sarai, but as soon as God said that her name is no longer going to be Sarai, but Sarah, God immediately at that time starts addressing her as Sarah. So it's an immediate change that God is making so that her name will mean blessed queen and that great queens or great uh, descendants will come from this queen. So God immediately had that blessing upon Sarah as well. And it's a powerful message of expectation that we find here Abraham and his wife Sarah are probably going to have. And so I find three things in this passage I think is good for us to consider or to think about when it comes to expectations. And the first is the expectation that his son, now that God has promised that he is going to have a direct descendant named Isaac, that his son is going to be greater than Ishmael, his other son. And, and here's what it says, As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes and I will make him into a great nation. So God has said, I'm going to bless Ishmael as well. 
But if the covenant was as powerful, if the covenant was as strong, if the covenant was as uh, huge as God was saying, then surely the expectation that Abraham and his wife Sarah are going to have is that Isaac is going to be greater than Ishmael. If Ishmael is getting all of these blessings, that he is going to be Lord over all of this and all of these different people, then won't Isaac have so much more? And won't he be so much more? So I'm going to bet that there was an expectation from Abraham and Sarah that Isaac was going to flourish and he was going to flourish greatly and that his descendants, however they might look, are going to flourish greatly. How many of us want our kids to flourish when our children are born? Don't we all have expectations of them? Don't we believe that they are going to rule the world? And unless you're the father of Jeff Bezos, it probably hasn't worked out that way. But we all have these great expectations of our children when they're born, uh, that we want them to become uh, wonderful. We want them to become godly people. We want them to prosper greatly. And so with great faith, we turn that over to our Lord, and we ask our Lord to intervene into the circumstances of our children so that they truly can be blessed. And I think Abraham and Sarah, with that same sense of faith, are going to have those hopes and those expectations of their son Isaac yet to be born. And they're going to have this expectation uh, from the promises that God has already given to them uh, of the sand and the stars. On the screen above you or in the screen in front of you, you're going to see a picture of the night sky. And in the text that we read earlier, you see that God told Abraham, that count all of the stars in the sky if you can. And your descendants are still going to be more than that. And just think about all of the sand on the seashores as we think about all of the wonderful things that God says to Abraham. The sand on the seashores, if you can count them, there is going to be more descendants than that. If we think about all of those people and all of the sand that's there. I can only put so much sand in my hand, but thinking about all of the sand that's just in one handful, think about all of the people, all of the descendants that that represents. Is that the descendants just here in Naperville? Is that the descendants that are just here in Aurora? Is that the descendants in just the city of Chicago or just the state of Illinois? Who knows how many descendants are in that one handful of sand? And think about that spread all over the world in all of the seashores and all of the sand that there is by the seashores. Those are the descendants and more that Abraham had to expect over the course of generations were going to come. What great faith it must have been for him to entrust that the birth of his son was going to give rise to so many people over the course of history. And we continue to see all of those people who are brought into God's family through his holy covenant. Even today, just today alone, there are some two billion people who are Christians. And think about how many grains of sand or how big of a pile of sand you need to have to have two billion Christians. And then you multiply that throughout the course of thousands and thousands of years. How powerful a witness that is and how powerful a sight that is as we think about the grace and the good things of God. And that perhaps is the next and, and perhaps the, the most powerful of the expectations that God has and of that Abraham and Sarah have. And that's a reminder of God's grace and blessing. The promises that his descendants will be more than he can even number. That he will have a child at his age. The faith to be promised that. The faith to turn that over to our Lord. But even more than that, it's interesting, when God says your son's name is going to be Isaac, the name Isaac means he laughs. And so I think God uses this as a teachable moment for Abraham. 
Because the text says that then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? So he is going to be old, very elderly, when he has this child. And it doesn't say whether he laughed out loud or laughed inwardly. It just says that inwardly he said, am I going to have a child at this advanced age? But he laughed. And so when God names Isaac, he laughs. I think Abraham was meant to remember every time he spoke the name Isaac out loud, to remind him of that time that he questioned God, but he's going to let, or he's going to allow God to grow his faith every time he utters the name of his son out loud. Yeah, at times I can laugh, but the Lord's still going to give me grace and give me blessing. The moment he laughed and questioned God, God could have said, you know what, I don't need this. You know what, I'm going to find somebody else to fulfill this blessing. But God said to Abraham, even in the midst of those times when you have doubted, I'm still going to honor my promise. I'm still going to honor the covenant that I have made with you. And those expectations that you might have about the birth of your son and who your son's going to be, they're all going to be fulfilled. I promise you that. And I think that's powerful when we think about our Lord Jesus and when we think about the expectations that so many had when he was born. Now, just Mary and Joseph were there, but then the shepherds came and the angelic choirs and so many more were going to get to share in the joy of the birth of Jesus Christ into this world. All the promises of the Old Testament gave rise to the expectations of who Jesus would be when he was born. Would Jesus be able to fulfill those? Would Jesus be able to live a sinful, a sinless life? Would Jesus be able to um, get rid of sin? Would Jesus be able to atone for the sins of the world? Would we finally be free from sin. What is the power in Jesus' name when God said through the angel, your son is going to be called Emmanuel, God with us. And even the name Jesus means salvation and savior. So everything that Abraham went through and Sarah went through and the expectations of their son we find those same expectations being fulfilled in Jesus. He truly brings a covenant together that makes the descendants of God greater than the stars above or the sands on the seashore. His name is meant to grow our faith and bring us closer to God and show us who we are in our humanity. That sometimes we do question God, but God is faithful. And he continues to grant us the great blessings that we already have through our Lord Jesus Christ and we will continue to have. And we are greater than the world. We are greater than the other covenants of this world. That is the power of confessing Jesus Christ. And that is the power of believing that covenants matter and, and that the expectations that come with those promises through those covenants have been fulfilled by God and have been given to us freely that we can enjoy them in our lives. And so as you think about the expectations maybe that you have of your children, where are they at? How have they been fulfilled or how are they being fulfilled? When you look at Isaac in the Old Testament and you think of our Lord Jesus Christ, does that give you strength, encouragement, hope that God could fulfill so many promises in your life? That is the question that challenges us as we think about the expectations we have. May God fulfill all of those expectations and those promises and even more. In Jesus' name, amen.
ask you to join me for prayer. God Almighty, who meets and surpasses all expectations, we thank you for your infinite majesty, grace, and fellowship. No God conceived by man dares have a relationship with his people as you do. That is why you are greater. We thank you for all that you are and how you have cared for your people throughout the generations. As we begin this season of Advent, we pray for continued mercies to be given to all who wait with anticipation for you. Show us all how to be more patient as we deal with the frenetic pace of our lives. Care for all. Heal those who are sick. Strengthen the weak. Minister as our great High Priest. May your protection be upon our homes, churches, and schools. May evil pass by and be removed from our lives. Remind us of the legacy of faith that we share with the saints in heaven. Open our eyes to the joy that is coming. Give us your eternal peace. Help us to seek after the ways of reconciliation and not anger, vindictiveness, and revenge. Bless those celebrating. Comfort those who mourn. Open the hearts of those hurting to receive your mercy. For these prayers and all other prayers that we have, we lift them to you, Heavenly Father, as they join our other expectations. We thank you for hearing them. We pray for your answers to be revealed swiftly. Continue to hear our prayers, especially as we pray what you have taught us in Scripture, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord fulfill your expectations as you worship him throughout the week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. i
I want to thank you for joining us today as you worship through this Advent season. If there's anything that we can do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at either Christ Our Savior Lutheran Church, New Song Community Church, or Word of Life Lutheran Church. We would love to be able to answer any questions about God, about Christianity, how Jesus fits into your life, and what the message of salvation can mean for you. So please do reach out to us, and may God bless your week ahead.